The following message was preached at Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church in Pasadena, Texas in 2006. It is an introduction of the verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation. If you are a child of God, you can understand Revelation. Amen. The truth of the matter is, as far as understanding what it's about, it's one of the easiest books to understand because it's outlined so easily, and I'll give you the outline of the book tonight, along with some other, I think, very exciting information. This morning, I want to give you an introduction to the book. We'll look at uh, Revelation chapter 1. I want you to go ahead and turn over there. Now, if you do not have a good study Bible, you need to get one and bring it with you uh, to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, especially on Sunday night if you're wanting to learn more about the book of Revelation. But this morning I just want us to look at the introduction of this book. The first thing that I want you to notice is the title that is in most of your Bibles. Someone give me the title that's recorded in your Bible of this particular book. Brother Sonny? Says, the revelation of St. John the Divine. Now, isn't that something? Now, I want to tell you at the very beginning that the title is not inspired. The title is not a part of the inspired Word of God. Now, there are some th people that think that the contents all the way back through the maps is the inspired Word of God. It is not. The book of Revelation is God's inspired Word of God. But the title, the revelation of St. John the Divine, is not a good title of this book at all. To begin with, um, John was not divine. Divinity belongs to God only, amen? John was not the divine. So when the interpreters and the translators uh, added the title to this book, they simply got it wrong, but I want you to understand that some of the influence um, in the title of this book came from a major religion that believed that certain people were divine, but we know that they were not. Now, if you want to, um, if you want to have the correct title of the book, it's given to you in the very first verse. That is the correct title of the book where it says the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. So that is the correct title of the book and that's what the book is all about. Now there's a couple of things I want you to note here. Number one, notice it says revelation and not revelations. Please, those of you that start coming on Sunday night, don't let me hear you say revelations. It's not the book of revelations. It's only one revelation. It is the revelation of who, and I'll talk more about this in a few moments, the focus of the book is Jesus Christ. Now, many people miss the understanding of the book of Revelation because they have it all wrong. Yes, this is a book of prophecy. Yes, this is an exciting book about end-time events. But that's not the purpose or the focus of the book. The focus of the book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The second thing I want you to notice about that right there is, you notice it says re revelation. The, many people think that this book is a secret book. Where the word itself will tell you that it's not a secret book. The word revelation here means the revealing of Jesus Christ or the unveiling. Actually, the Greek word means to unveil something. That's actually what it means. It is the unveiling. So it's not the covering up. It's not a secret book that we cannot understand for years and years and years, especially before our time. People thought that they couldn't understand the book of Revelation. I will also tell you in a few moments this morning the reason why, listen to this, we are more equipped to understand the book of Revelation today than they were a hundred years ago, or even during the time when John actually revealed it to the seven churches of Asia. So this is not a secret book. It is the revealing or the uncovering of the great truths 
of the things that's going to happen to this planet Earth in the future. Revelation is the grand central station of the Bible. Folks, this is where it all comes together. All of the trains of the Word of God come in and end into the book of Revelation. This is the grand central station of the Bible. If you are saved, there is no reason why you cannot understand this book. As you come to know and understand this book, God is going to bless you richly. Again, we will notice that in a few moments also. Now let me tell you a little bit about John. John is the writer. He's the man to whom God chose to reveal this information to. John is up in years. Matter of fact, he's the last apostle that is living. He could be anywhere between 80 years old and even up to 100 years old, depending upon when this book was written. Some say it was written around 86 A.D. Some say it was written as late as 96 A.D. So John, in our, uh, in our world, is an old man, and in his world, he was also an old man. John... Not only did he write this book, but he wrote uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and he also wrote St. John under the inspiration of God. Now, many years earlier, before writing the book of Revelation, John had met personally, face-to-face, -face, Jesus Christ. Jesus was already his Savior before he ever met him face-to-face. John the Apostle was saved under the ministry of John the Baptist. He heard the gospel. He accepted Christ as his Savior. Then one day, John met Jesus face to face, and Jesus said to this professional fisherman, he says, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And on that day, John entered into a full-time relationship with his Savior Jesus Christ and he continued to walk with the Lord matter of fact when the scripture talks about my beloved apostle or my beloved friend that loves me Jesus is talking about John John was this man that was standing with, with Jesus' mother there at the foot of the cross John was the one to whom Jesus said I want you to take care of my mother as if she is your own mother so John the Apostle was very special to Jesus Christ. He was also present at many important occasions during the life of Jesus Christ. Let me just give you a few. He was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Jesus glorified. He was there at the Garden of Gethsemane. He saw Jesus submitting to the cross. He was there at the foot of the cross. He saw Jesus crucified. As I mentioned earlier, John writes five books of the Bible. First, second, first, second, third John, the book of Revelation, and also St. John. Now, I think this is interesting. The book of John, when you look at the book of John, it represents believe. What do you get when you read the book of John? Believe, believe, believe. The book of John is one of the best books in the entire Word of God on leading someone how to believe in God and accept Christ as their Savior. Amen? When you come to the uh, epistles... The subject there is be sure of what you believe. Amen? If you've studied that, that's what it means. When you come to Revelation, it simply means to be ready. So John is believe. The epistles is be sure what you believe. And number three, the book of Revelation, because you believe and you're sure of it, you better be ready. Then the book of John is a great book for salvation. The book of, of the epistles are great books for sanctification. That means to begin to set yourself apart for the work that God wants you to do. And the uh, book of Revelation shows God's sovereignty. The book of John portrays Jesus as the prophet. The epistles portrays Jesus as the priest. And Revelation portrays Jesus as who? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the master of all. John took, the Lord Jesus Christ actually took John from a very busy life. Even though he was an older man, John was still actively involved in God's work. Again, I, I don't know how old he was, anywhere between 80 and his 90s possibly. He was, I think he was still pastoring the church at Ephesus. But God took him from the church there at Ephesus 
and permitted him to be in a location where no one else was, and God revealed what we're going to be studying on Sunday nights, the book of Revelation. Now, if you want to, this afternoon, instead of taking a nap, just sit down and read this book. You can actually read this book between two and three hours. It don't take you long to study. It'll take us probably close to a year to get through it because I want us to look at it very closely. But it won't take you long to, to read it at all. But God gave him the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now God used something, listen to this, God used something very terrible to provide something wonderful. God used something terrible that happened in the life of John to do something wonderful for him. Most of you that have studied the book of Revelation, you know what that was. John was the last apostle that was living. And John could not keep his mouth quiet about the greatness of God. John could not be quiet about who Jesus Christ was. John was pastoring a wonderful church that had probably several hundred members. And he was influencing the lives of these people. That church was changing the lives of people. Where the emperor, and I think it was probably Domitian who his, who his name was, he wanted to kill John to shut him up. He'd already had all the other apostles killed. But the problem with John was this. John had a big influence on the lives of thousands of people. And the emperor knew that if he had John killed, matter of fact, some of his counselors came to him and said, if you kill John, we're going to have a problem. We're going to have an uproar. We're going to have a civil war. If you kill John, they said, I'll give you another idea. Let's just put him someplace where no one will hear him speak. So what they did, they took John, they arrested him and took him, took him and placed him on a deserted island, the island of Patmos. Matter of fact, I've got a map here of the island on the screen here. This is, the, this is a, a, a map of, um, let me show you some of the places here. This is Greece, which would be Italy today. Uh, these here are the seven churches of Asia right in this area. And you probably can't see it if you're sitting way in the back, but right there is a little bitty island. I can't remember the size of it. I think it's about 40 or 50 square miles. And that's where John was placed. Not to keep him quiet. He could speak as much as he wanted to over there, but just nobody else would be able to hear him. And it was while John was there, and I will see this tonight, but it was while John was there, on a Sunday morning, I believe it was, it was on the Lord's Day, I think it was on a Sunday morning, while Jesus, while he was simply worshiping God, having his devotion, even though he was by himself, he still met in a very special way. And I'll show you that tonight. But while John was there on the Lord's Day, Jesus Christ came all the way to heaven and appeared to John and opened the windows of heaven and showed him the book of Revelation. And John wrote it down. Jesus said, I want you to write it down. And he wrote it down. And we'll see later that he wrote it down and then it was distributed. Old Dimension messed up. John later was released from Patmos, went back to Ephesus. But he distributed the book of Revelation throughout the seven churches of Asia. And that's what we have today, and it has been recorded, and it has been, the book of Revelation has been read probably by more people than any other book in the entire world that has ever been written and understood by more people. Now, I want you to notice the focus of the book of Revelation. Again, this morning, I'm just giving you a foundation. This is not an exciting message this morning, but you must have this if you want to understand this. By the way, we're recording all of these services, and if you miss one, just ask Sherry, and she'll be more than happy to make uh, a CD for you. But I want you to notice the focus of the book of Revelation, and the focus of the book of Revelation is actually the first five words. If you don't get this down, you're not going to understand it. And what is the first five words? The revelation of Jesus Christ. That is the focus of the book. It's not John. It's not the Antichrist. It's not the beast. It's not the symbols that we'll be looking at. It's Jesus Christ. He is the focus of the book. 
the word revelation, as I mentioned earlier, it is the unveiling. It is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Anyone here remember back in the older days in September, what used to happen in September? They had they unveiled something. Some of you remember, Johnny, you remember that, don't you, in September? What, were they, what was it they always unveiled? It was the new automobiles. You remember in September, they would always unveil the new automobiles. Matter of fact, if you'd go to the to the uh, showroom, they would have it covered up, and they would wait until a certain day, and they would remove the veil so you could see it. That's what God is doing here. He's removing the veil. The Bible talks a lot about God, but now when you get to the book of Revelation, the veil is removed, and you truly see who Jesus Christ really is. And you see Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation like you don't see him anywhere else in the rest of the word of God. While on earth, Jesus' glory was veiled in human flesh. But as we see him, especially next Sunday night, I think it's next Sunday night, you will really see a picture of Jesus like you've never seen before. On the Mount of Transfiguration, John got a very brief glimpse of the glorified Jesus. Human eyes could hardly stand the intensity, but in Revelation, God allows John to see Jesus completely unveiled before him in all of his splendor and majesty and glory. In Revelation, you'll see Jesus for who he is. You'll see his power like you've never seen before. In the Gospels, we saw Jesus when he came the first time. In the book of Revelation, you will see him as he comes back the second time. And when he comes back the second time, my friend, who he really is will be completely unveiled. You'll see the God of God, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings. In the Gospel, we saw his crucifixion. In the book of Revelation, we'll see his crown into the highest office. In the gospel, he came to a tree. In Revelation, he will come to a throne. In the, in the gospels, he stood to be judged. But in Revelation, all who stand before him will be judged. In the gospels, he suffered shame. But in Revelation, he will show splendor. In the gospel, he came to redeem. But in Revelation, he will come to reign and to judge. In the gospels, he was the justifier. But in Revelation, my friend, he will be the judge of all mankind. Here we will see both sides of Jesus. He came first to redeem, but his second coming will be for a different purpose altogether. Some love to study prophecy. I've heard a lot of people say, I love to study prophecy. You ought to love to study Jesus Christ. I love prophecy if it lifts up Jesus Christ. As we launched out into this powerful study, we need to not just be looking for the sensational of the book of Revelation, but we need to be looking at the closer look of Jesus Christ, not just for future events, but for the coming king. What is the focus of this book? It's in the very first five words. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't just study revelation to obtain the facts. Focus on Jesus, and he will give you the facts. Notice again what the title of the book says that it is. Again, we will focus on Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the purpose of the book of Revelation. What purpose does this book serve? Again, notice verse 1. It's to show the future. For the scripture says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, what does it say? To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. We'll talk about that word shortly later on uh, in the weeks to come. But what is the purpose of Revelation? The purpose is to show the future. Many go around prophesying about what will happen in the future. I remember back in the 80s, there was a book written in 1988. It was a popular book, and it said 88 reasons he's coming back in 88. It was a big seller. Not now. Nobody buys that book now because <laughs> there's... I can give you a thousand reasons why he didn't come back in 1988. Many claim to be able to predict the future, but listen, all that we, all that God wants us to know about the future is already recorded in the Word of God. No one has, listen, you've got to understand this, no one has a handle on the future. I don't care how great a preacher he is, he don't know anything that you cannot know. If you will open up the Word of God and study it on your own, my, and, and the future is being fulfilled in 100% accuracy. 
just as God said it would. The Psychic Friends Network don't know anything about the future. Many read their daily horoscope. Some folks won't even hardly get out of the house until they've read their horoscope to find out what's going to happen to them that, that day. I haven't found many of those things that's good. Matter of fact, uh, I read one the other day. I was at a Chinese restaurant. It's been a while ago and, and got one, and it told me that I was going to die. I didn't like that. It was depression. You say, well, you actually said you was going to die. Yeah, it said this will be the best day of your life. So I just suspected this would be the day that I would die. But that it didn't come true. And it wasn't the best day of my life. Many read these horoscopes. They, they, they read the signs out in front of the fortune teller's locations where it says, Ask Madame Zoger, or whatever her name is. It says, See, She sees all, she knows all, she tells all. And then at the very bottom it says, Honk, so we know you're out there. <laughs> Isn't that silly? <laughs> Look like if she sees all and knows all, she'd know when you came up without honking. Amen? That's kind of crazy. Why would she have a doorbell if she knew you was there? But my friend, when I say we of this scripture, who are we talking about? When it says to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Who is the we of this scripture? It's his servants. It's his servants. To show unto his servants. I'm happy to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Aren't you? There are some that don't like the term servant. And I can understand why some would not like the term a servant, especially the uh, way this country and, and other countries uh, treated some of the people, slaves that they brought to this country. But my friend, if you are a servant of Jesus Christ, you have a wonderful master. You have a great master. You should be proud that God refers to you as one of his servants. Now, if you're not saved, you're also a servant. We won't jump over there this morning, but if you go to Romans chapter 6, it tells you who you are a servant of. If you're not saved, Romans chapter 6 says you are a servant to sin. That's your master. But the Bible says once you become a child of God, that now you become the servant of righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you will not be able to understand the book of Revelation. My friend, the book of Revelation was not written to the lost. Matter of fact, if you stay with me on Sunday nights, I will even show you in, in very plain English that you can understand that the book of Revelation actually wasn't even written to all the saved. It was actually written to the churches of Jesus Christ. That's easy to understand when we get over in, in chapter uh, 3 and chapter 4. It's so easy to understand. But if you're not saved, don't even expect to be able to understand this book. See, the purpose of this book is to reveal the future to his faithful servants. Now, who are the faithful servants? We've talked about that so very much. It's the child of God that is obeying Jesus Christ and that is serving Jesus Christ. Now, one method that God uses to communicate these great truths to us is symbolisms. And so many people, they go to the book of Revelation, they begin to read it, and they say, well, there's no way I can understand this. There's so many symbolisms in the book of Revelation. Well, we just got through going through the time period of the Da Vinci Code. And they say that there were special secret codes out there that, that Da Vinci revealed to the world in some of his paintings. Well, a lot of that's hogwash. We know that it is. But my friend, the book of Revelation is written in a secret code. It's written in symbolisms. And the only ones that can truly understand what that secret code is, number one, is the child of God. And number two, there is another must. You must have an understanding of the rest of the Word of God. If you want to understand what the book of Revelation is about. If you want to get the full effect of the book of Revelation, you've got to have an understanding of the rest of the Word of God. And we'll go through that as we study 
verse by verse study on verse by verse on Sunday nights. See, there's hundreds of references in Revelation to the Old Testament. Therefore, Revelation can only be interpreted in light of the Old Testament. By the way, do you know what the best commentary of the Bible is? The Bible. So when you begin to interpret the Word of God, then again, this is a big mistake of the religious world out there. They interpret the Word of God kind of like they would read a newspaper, kind of privately. They look at a scripture and they say, Aha, I see what that says. I know what the Bible says. You can't interpret the Word of God that way. The scripture says, I think it's over in 1 Peter, it says no scripture is of any private interpretation. What that means is you must interpret every verse of Scripture in light of the entire Word of God. And if there is a contradiction in the Word of God, you better look at it closely because I'm telling you right now, there is no such thing as in a contradiction in the Word of God. God is not two-faced like we are. What He says, there's sometimes there's some misunderstanding of the interpretation, but look at it closely, read the context of the Word of God, look at it in light of the rest of the Word of God, then you can begin to interpret what the Bible is all about. We have an anchor to the interpretation of Revelation. And what that is, is what God has already said. Why is it that Revelation is the last book of the Bible? The very last book that was recorded because there's no way that you could take Revelation and put it at the beginning and understand anything about what God was talking about. Amen? So it has to be the very last book, which means you better have read the rest of the book before you get to Revelation. And you better understand the rest of the book before you get to Revelation. You say, well, Pastor, that's going to leave me out because there's much of the Bible I don't understand. Well, let me tell you something. I found out. There's more about the Word of God that I don't understand than what I do understand. But you can understand enough to begin to have an understanding. Now, will I be able to interpret correctly every verse of Scripture in the book of Revelation? No. There's some of it I still have not been able to figure out. And I doubt in this lifetime I ever will. But the substance of the book is very easy to begin to understand. Then... Why is it that these it was written in these symbolic spiritual codes? It secondly, it conveys the message of end time events with deeper, deeper emotion. Let me give you some examples. John could have written, "A dictator will rule the world," but he didn't say that. He says he calls him a beast. A beast will rule the world. Why? Why does God? inspired John to refer to a man as a beast that will rule the world. I think it conveys a deeper emotion. It conveys who that man is and what type of man that he will be. It represents his power and his cruelty. John could, let me give you another example. John could have said that one day there will be a one world government. John does not say that. Instead, John uses a secret code. And it's easy for us to understand because we have the book to explain it to us. Instead of using one world government, he refers to as Babylon the Great, an Old Testament reference that will represent, if you study Ezekiel and Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, you will understand what he has reference to here. Listen, and this is something you've got to understand. John is using, personally, I think, 21st century things in first century knowledge and language. You say, well, why do you say that's what I think? Because I think that the end time is right here on us. I really believe that. You may call me crazy if you want to. You certainly won't be the first person that's ever referred to me as crazy. But I, unless I die real quickly here in the next day or two, I don't much think that I'm going to have to go to Jesus Christ through a hole in the ground. I think I'm going to go to Jesus Christ through a hole in the sky. I believe the rapture is right here upon us. So that's why I say that John uses 21st century things as he explains what he saw in Revelation. He is 
he is using the knowledge of first century and the language of first century. If you, let me give you what I'm talking about. If you lived 1,900 years ago, almost close to 2,000 years ago when this book was written now, and if you saw a sky full of assault helicopters firing missile, missiles on vegetation and destroying all the vegetation, how would you explain it? You've never seen an assault helicopter. We know what an assault helicopter looks like, right? But John had never seen that. So what does John refer to, I think, as an assault helicopter? He says it's a sky full of giant locusts that has fire in the hills. I don't personally think that John saw a sky full of, of locusts. Do I believe that the symbol is wrong? No, I think the symbol is correct. But you've got to understand what the symbol represents. And again, let me give you another example. If God showed you the devastation of a nuclear bomb and you saw an entire city wiped out, how would you describe it? Folks, John never saw an automobile, much less a helicopter. John never saw a hand grenade, much less the devastation of a nuclear bomb. But you and I, we've seen it, haven't we? We know the devastation that takes place. We know it can wipe out an entire city. So what John is using here, he's using first century knowledge and language to explain things that's going to occur, which I believe, in the 21st century. This helps you to understand what Revelation is all about. It helps you to understand the symbols. How are we to interpret this highly symbolic book? How are we to interpret it literally or symbolically? And the answer is yes. We're to interpret it both literally and symbolically. Discover what this symbol stands for and believe it literally. Amen? That's the way you understand the book of Revelation. For example, I want you to jump over to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And you notice I get excited when I get in Revelation. I really do. But I want to read some of Revelation chapter 12. Think about the symbols that you're reading, the secret codes that are here. And most of this, if you think about it, you can understand it. Let's start with verse 1. Revelation 12, and there appeared a great woman, a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Now we know what that's talking about, don't we? That's talking about Israel, is it not? That's easy to understand. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and the seven crowns upon his head. Now, that's not talking about a beast that, that has literally uh, seven uh, heads and, and ten horns. It's something ugly monster. My friend, it's talking about the Roman Empire. It's talking that the dragon is the devil himself who is in charge of the Roman Empire. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, talking about Israel, which was ready to be delivered, speaking of Christ that would be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child, speaking of Jesus, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up into God and to his throne. See right there, that verse right there, it covers thousands of years of time, does it not? It covers before he was born, back to Israel in the Old Testament, covers his birth, covers his life, covers when he went back up into heaven, even covers the millennial reign of Christ. And the woman fled into the wilderness, speaking of Israel, where she hath a praise prepared of God that they should feed her 3,000, feed, feed her there 1,203 score and day. That's talking about the tribulation period. We could go ahead and read the rest of this. It's not difficult to understand when you study it in light of the rest of the Word of God, but you've got to have a knowledge of the word of God. Satan is referred to as a dragon having a tail so long that he can knock one third of the stars from heaven. This is not stars that he knocks out, literal stars that he knocks out of heaven. It represents the one third of the fallen angels that followed him out of heaven at the very beginning of time. And I'm not going to get into that this morning, but that even happened before man got here. The third of the... Uh, demon creatures, the angels that God had created, a third of them in heaven followed Satan himself and was cast down to this earth. So that's what that has reference to. 
don't do like many and say, well, that's symbolism. There's really not a devil. No, that's symbolism, and it stands for a literal devil. Amen? That's what it stands for. Find out what the st symbol stands for, and then literally believe it. Finally, we see what the focus of the book is about. It's Jesus Christ. We see the purpose of the book is to show the future to God's servants. What is the fruit of the book? The fruit of the book is in verse 3. Notice what verse 3 says. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. We will see that this world is heading toward economic disaster. You think it's bad now. You haven't seen anything yet. We will see that this world is heading toward natural disaster. Nuclear wars, famines, pestilence. But through it all, we will see that God is in full control. He predicts it all in his book. And I want you to understand that it's not just enough to read it. It's not just enough to understand it. The scripture says we should heed to it. See, the real side of whether you believe this prophecy is not how high you jump when you hear these things. It's how straight you walk with your feet on the ground. That's whether or not you truly believe it. If you heed to what you believe. As you come on Sunday nights, don't leave just filled with prophecy. Leave with the desire to be a greater soul winner to go out into this world and give warning to this world about what's going to happen. Don't just get filled up with prophecy and say, man, I know what's going to happen. What are you going to do about it? If I left today and was going somewhere and I saw a man's house on fire or somebody called me and said, listen, I just found out that somebody's going to bomb Dave's house this afternoon at 3 o'clock. What would I do? I would warn Dave. My friend, a bomb is going to occur. We need to be warning people about what's going to happen in the future. Just don't get filled up with the prophecy. My friend, when you study the book of Revelation, it should cause you to be a greater soul winner. See, Revelation gives us a winning perspective. The book can change our world. The book can change our community. The book can change our nation. But how can it do that? That is if we heed to it and take the message to the world in which we live. World events may grieve us. They may sadden us. But they don't have to shake us. You see, as we study the very last book of the Bible, we will see that we're on the winning team. We're going to win. I've joined forces with God. It looks like we're losing. But we're not. God knows what's going on. Go back and read the book of Habakkuk again. The prophet, he cried out to God, he said, God, do you not hear? God, do you not see what's happening to your people down here? God, do you not see that your people are turning against you? God, do you not see that this world is, is getting, getting eat up with sin? And what did God say to that prophet? You remember we studied that a couple of years ago. You remember, what did God say to that prophet? He said, I've got it under control. If you could only see what I'm doing in the background, and then he revealed to him what he was doing in the background. I don't know what's going to happen in the future as far as our nation. But I know God's got it in control. When you jump all the way to the end, you see that we're going to win. We may lose a few battles, but we're going to win. Notice again in verse 3, it says the time is at hand. You say, well, that verse has been written for 1,900 years. 
my friend I don't know of anything that yet needs to take place before the day of the Lord begins and when the book of Revelation speaks of the day of the Lord it is talking about more than just one day but the day of the Lord begins the very moment that we hear that thunder we hear the voice of the archangel we hear the voice of God and the rapture of the saints occur. The time is at hand. Are you his servant? Are you a child of the king? I pray that the study of the book of Revelation will set this church on fire like she's never been on fire before. Not just to gather facts, not just to understand prophecy, but to understand who Jesus truly is because you will see him like you've never seen him before and understand that yes he came as a loving savior to redeem the world but when he comes back this world will experience the raft of God like she's never seen before it's our responsibility to understand that and warn others about it. Are you doing your part? You hear this morning, you're not a child of God. You look back in your life and you see that there never was a time that you understood that you was a sinner separated from God. You need to understand this morning that you are on your way to hell. But God loves you. The wrath of God has not begun. The end time is not yet here. He still yet gives you an opportunity today to be saved. It could begin this afternoon. It could begin tonight. But right now, you have that opportunity to be saved. Tomorrow, I don't guarantee that to you. Next Sunday, I don't guarantee you. We may not begin to give it, to do this study tonight. That's okay with me. I'll go ahead and go to heaven and let God explain it all to me. Amen? But if you're here and you've never been saved, you're not ready. Well, how can I be saved? Understand that you're a sinner. What is sin? Anything that's wrong. Understand you've done wrong to God. Ask God to forgive you. Believe that Jesus Christ came and paid your sin debt because the penalty of sin is separation from God. And all the, the ultimate separation is hell itself. But Jesus Christ came and paid your sin debt on the cross of Calvary. He died for you. Jesus himself came and died for you. The Jesus that will be studying Revelation first came and died for you. Accept what he did for you on the cross. Ask God to forgive you. Ask Jesus to save you. And he'll do that this morning as we stand very quietly and very reverently. Father, dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege to study your book today. Oh God, I pray for that man, woman, boy, and girl in our service today. Maybe that person has never been saved. I pray God right now as you speak to them that they would come and trust Christ as their Savior. Better yet, Lord, I pray they'd do it right where they are. Right now, as I pray, I pray that they would pray. God, forgive me. Jesus, save me. And mean it from their heart. Lord, if you do save them, I pray that you give them the courage to come forth and let me share with this church what marvelous things you have done here today. Lord, the rest of us who are saved, help us to be better servants. Help us to be able to warn others about what's going to happen in the future. In Jesus' name I pray.